Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott chats with John Sellers, who, along with his wife, Courtney, started Martin Coffee House as a way of funding library projects in Nepal. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South as we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. I am super excited about my next guest, and I have drank about 10 cups of coffee waiting for him to get here. My guest this week has about 15 jobs, and from what I can see, he does them all extremely well. John Sellers and his wife, Courtney, started Martin Coffee House in Martin, Tennessee in August of 2017. Additionally, they have founded and run six other businesses and nonprofits, one of which is Coffee for Literacy. Coffee for Literacy is an initiative started to fund literacy projects in a sustainable way. The Coffee for Literacy Project is a faith-based nonprofit dedicated to bridge the literacy gap. Martin Coffee House donates 10 cents from every cup to sustainable literacy projects in Nepal and Kenya. So far, they've completed their first library for the Collins Children's Home in Kathmandu, Nepal, and I hear more are on the way. Welcome, John. Thank you. So excited to be here. I'm, I'm, I actually um, stopped and took a picture in front of your coffee shop really? yesterday. So, That's awesome. Um, yeah, I've uh, really been excited. I've been in there many times, and I love the place. Um, and so... Tell me a little bit about it. What 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 do you guys do in now? Tell me about that, and then also some of these other projects you have have uh, going on. Introduce me to your world. <laughs> well, Martin Coffee House was started um, for one reason. We very much wanted to bridge uh, the literacy gap in Nepal. We wanted to do that in a sustainable way. Um, I guess the the long story long is uh, back in 1991, my uncle and Joe, my uncle Joe and Aunt Tana were missionaries to Tibetan refugees over in Nepal. Um, they served there for two years. They started a small uh, orphanage and a small church work. Uh, my aunt became very sick um, and had to fly out of the country to Thailand. She was diagnosed with typhoid fever there. Um, when they flew back in, the plane uh, crashed with my aunt and my uncle, my five nephews and nieces, along with ten other 110 other people. Um, after that, like reached the States, uh, my grandparents, uh, Granny and Pappy, um, Martha and Jerry Sellers flew to Nepal for the memorial service there and saw their name carved to the rock. Um, and they took over that small work. So all my life, all my life, I had heard about Nepal, uh, I was in between China and India, so where Mount Everest is at. I heard about my hero, like Uncle Joe and Aunt Tana. And where were you living? At this I was like in, I was in Henderson, Tennessee, uh, for a large part of my life. Uh, my dad owned a barbecue pit there oh. uh, where we cooked whole hog barbecue. Re- learned how to work very hard with that business. I bet. Um, but yeah, they were, um, all my life I had heard about making an impact in Nepal and, and what it was like and, and desperately wanted to be there, wanted to be involved in some way, but didn't know to what capacity that I would be involved with that. Um, and then finally, ab- about 10 years ago, um, my both my grandparents passed away then, and then my parents uh, took up that work. So they flew to Nepal. Uh, they started to be missionaries over there. They sold the barbecue business. Um, and then there I was in Nepal at long last. Um, and how tr- old were you? Seven, uh, 16, 17. There is 1991. I'm 27 now. Um, so all this time, it's like all this pressure. Here we are finally inside this country. What ready- a culture shift. Yeah. And like ready to make an impact. And it was so tremendously much more harder than I, that I thought it would be. And I didn't know running water. They were on load shedding, so they had different power outages all the time. Um, but, and all this buildup was always there. Um, made a bunch of friends, made a best friend named Kumar. Um, we, and I just threw on a backpack and we traveled all throughout that country. I wanted to soak it all in. I wanted to learn as much as I could about it. 
And then finally, I ended up in Kumar's village, which is eastern Nepal. And I was sitting around a fire with all the people around me. And they were just asking me, like, why are you here? And then it kind of appeared to me like I didn't really know why I was there anymore. I was like, I was, I was very much aware that my presence wasn't enough to, to alleviate any plight whatsoever. And that was hard. So I think uh, a lot of times before, for some reason, I had an idea like, oh, just me being in country is enough. But I had no skill, I had no resources, I had no connections, and this huge need that I was seeing in front of me, with, which was no access to education, specifically inside of literacy, none of that was there. And there's no system, there's no fundraising system, no sustainable system, and I thought, well, I could go do something, but I, I didn't build anything, I didn't, I didn't have anything. And really from that moment there, for the next 10 years, every step that I have taken has tried to be to build a self-sustaining fundraising model that makes long-term impact in Nepal. And it started this whole journey of starting ventures and having a great, trying to build networks and trying to find, you know, missions, partners to all of this. And it has led to everything that we have now. And so uh, the coffee shop in Martin. Yeah. Um, you give 10 cents of every cup to this project. Yes. And tell me about the the library that is completed or almost completed. Or- yeah. Um, we opened up in August, 2017. In one year, we sold over 50,000 cups of coffee. That's awesome for little Martin, Tennessee. It's great for Nashville. It's really good numbers. Uh, 10 cents of that built our first library. Uh, that Collins Children's Home, my uncle's name was Joe Collins. So that was the work that's been continued all of this time. We built a uh, already existing room. We built a library room onto that. Um, a lot of people donated books and desks and all that. And our, our project helped complete that. What a tribute. Yeah, and our our next one is um, in Joomla, Nepal. Um, it's an extremely remote part. I was working for a nonprofit there while I was living there, and uh, it's very intense to get out there. It's a six hour hike after you get into the mountains to get to this region. We found some amazing people um, that we're going to be working with there, um, and that project it, it's it's triple the size. It's a library, but it really serves as a community center. That's going to have more for the whole community to be educated and and have ac- really just access to. Um, well, education in that way. Um, that's very similar to the mission here at Discovery Park, which is to expose people to new ideas and to help them see beyond. Um, you're doing the same kind of thing. Why Why coffee? Of all the different ways you could have raised money, what, what, what drove you into the coffee business? Well, a few different reasons. One, I tried a bunch and failed a bunch. Uh, we tried to do cashmere scarves. I was selling cashmere scarves while I was inside of the, inside of the University of Tennessee at Martin. And mm-hmm. you can imagine this college student with the backpack full of cashmere. I sold a lot of them, um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't sustainable. You know, once you buy a t-shirt or a bracelet or any sort of product that you have, I couldn't get repeat customers and the investment was too high on that end. I tried to sell tea. Uh, but once again, you know, a guy in college selling tea out of his backpack, that's kind of weird, right? You know, mm-hmm. I needed a building and a space to do that. It's not yeah. a tea culture here. But my wife really um, just kind of hit her. We bought a building downtown for our branding business, Fernway Fox. We do a lot of like marketing and that. We bought that building for that space. And Courtney, I guess it just clicked with her. She said, no, this is going to be a coffee shop. And then it just all connected together. I was thinking, man, coffee, that's, that's social, that's community, that's a gathering place, that's where the ideas are shared, that's where memories happen. And just this whole community outreach kind of centered around that aspect of it. I was like, what better way to connect a community to a community abroad? How can I do that, you know? And so we started trying to build out the plan and work out all the numbers because we didn't want to be too high. You can get a cup of coffee for two bucks, you know, sales tax included, and then take the 10 cents off of that. So coffee, for a lot of reasons, was the best way because the message of coffee, the feel of coffee is everything social and coming together. And then now you can drink a cup of coffee and, and make an impact. Right. And that's that's what we want to do. Yeah. It's amazing. Now, did you get a lot of pushback? Were there, were, did you have naysayers in your life who said, that's not a good idea? Yeah. I think the, the biggest part was one, Martin doesn't need another coffee shop. I think it was that we didn't have a drive through. So we got a lot of people saying you'll, you'll fail pretty quickly because you don't have access. You don't have a drive through there. Um, and there's a lot of value in having a drive through, but it's, you know, different style shop. Um, you know, the, the style of it is really, I mean, I don't like saying Nashville, it's very Nashville, but I think it could be very Martin too. You know, I feel like we really put a lot of emphasis on the aesthetic of it. It's a hundred year old building. I mean, we renovated it. We kept the original brick, got the floor done. I mean, it, it's really nice. So, 
Yeah, there's a lot of pushback and and people saying, why would you invest all the time here to do it? But it was just that, you know, Courtney and I decided to live in a small town because we fell in love with the small town and we love how close knit everything was. And we wanted more to be there. So why not take a shot at creating the more that we wanted, you know? And that's exactly what that Mark Coffee House is for us. Well, I'm glad you pushed through and went ahead and, you know, became successful at it because it is a great coffee shop, great coffee. Um, what, talk a little bit about your design firm. So you, you both, are you both designers? Uh, what? Yeah, Courtney is our, uh, she used to be an English teacher. She taught for three years. Um, and that coffee shop, she left teaching to come in to manage that. But she's always been a, a copywriter. She's been really great at writing all the copy for our commercials and um, just copy text for websites and that. And I had grown up around that. Working inside the barbecue pit, throw back to that. I wanted something not in the restaurant industry. I really wanted something that was design oriented that I could um, shoot with photography and graphic design and all that. So I became obsessed with that and uh, started shooting in college and built a pretty good uh, wedding career, shooting weddings. And then that got into uh, just design naturally. And then, I mean, the nonprofit demanded it. I mean, it, we did not ever expect to have a design firm, but when you're trying to, you know, make a movement happen, um, and really about four years ago, we did a, a large scale letter writing campaign underneath uh, Letters in Motion. Um, and, and it's all for this sake. It's, it all goes back to how do I make it easy to make an impact? Um, and really the need for marketing and branding and getting the hype up around that was through Fern White Fox. So in short, really, we, we said, you know, how do we make a difference? How do we make it easy? Let's collect 3,000 handwritten letters and deliver them to orphans over in Nepal. That was my first big thing. It's like my first thing after selling product was how do we make it easy? Um, and, in, and it took us like four months. We collected 3,000 letters, handwritten letters. It was from 10 universities, three different countries wrote in, just a massive amount of support that came in. And so we had to market that. Um, and right before we packed them all up, we said, the idea was this, it was like, okay, let's show people writing letters. Let's film that. Let's film us, put into a bag, put it on a plane, put it on a van riding through the, the Himalayas. Let's put it on our back and let's deliver that. Let's show that 10 minutes can make a difference and showing that reaction and uh, the connection there. Then let's follow up and let's do that. And the most beautiful thing happened with you know, when you go, when you come back from a vacation, say, or you come back from a trip, or maybe it's a humanitarian trip, and you're trying to have a conversation with somebody about it, and that conversation lasts about 30 seconds, right? Till they're disinterested, you know? And so I, and I felt that. I felt like having this enormous passion for Nepal and not knowing how to make a difference, showing that they can make that difference in a small step. It was amazing to see people who had never traveled before, students hopping on a plane to Nepal and then delivering letters to orphans in Nepal. And that's what can happen when you give people a road to impact. Right. And then there was a, on one of these trips, there was a a disaster that happened right before. Hey, uh, three weeks before we were planned to leave, all the letters were packed, sitting bags around us. And we get a call and we see all over the news, but we get a call from my my family um, that massive earthquake hit. One that Nepal, very rare. I mean, it's one of the biggest that they'd ever seen. Um, All the routes were done. There was no longer uh, connections to the schools. There was nothing. Everything is, I mean, everything was destroyed. Um, We didn't even know that we could land in the country. A lot of the relief planes, they were turning around because, I mean, it's just bottlenecking. Like everyone wants to help, but it's hard to coordinate that. And they didn't have good coordination on the ground. So when that happened, we, we really didn't know that any trip would happen in the first place. And I was getting calls from parents saying, you're not taking my baby on that trip. And under, I understand that. I understand. Of course, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and then all these people were, were calling me that had supported and said, we're so sorry that you can't go. We're so sorry. And it's just, we were bombarded by that. And I said, no, we have to go. Um, I called each member of the team and I said, hey, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't know if we can get around, but I know that we have to go. And I know that I can get money for relief structures. I know that we can adapt our plan and, you know, let's, let's do this, you know, let's just go and, and, and help in whatever way that we can. And we were really fortunate. Our, our, you know, network is good there. We were able to connect with some people who were really doing some life changing work and are still building temporary structures are still long-term impact over there, but our whole trip adapted to that. And I, and that's really, I guess that's what projected it to the degree that it did. Cause after we came back and it was, a, it was very difficult. I, I had never led people uh, through a country, let alone my first one being that mm. atmosphere it was very difficult. But because the infrastructure was I, probably I gone. mean, it was not even, and it wasn't built. I mean, 
infrastructure in third world country does not have the same standardization as it does in America. I mean, the, the things are not built to a, to a high standard in some aspects. And so a lot of the roads would just collapse and the buildings would just collapse. And so, I mean, imagine trying to get water and there's no more power. And then you're leading, I had seven, was it seven, seven people with me looking to me for all the answers to navigate throughout that country when no one knew what to do. That was a big learning part. But after we built the structures and we came back, it, it blew up, even, it blew up again. And, and then in two years, fast forward two years, we expanded to Kenya and Uganda and we expanded into building school desk and doing literacy packs with each letter. And it just evolved to, you know, what's the end goal? Like, you know, how do we scale this? Like we need more money in a way I kept on donating my own, but we need more, we need more. And it all interconnected into coffee. You know, how do we sustain this? How do we actually pay for things? And then how do we find the people who are going to stay with this project for 20 years and not five, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how it all came to be in a very stressful and painful way. But it, uh, but it's I mean, there now. It's there now. It's there now. And every good thing takes a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of blood, sweat and tears, you know, yeah. to make something great. It takes that. Yeah. Well, but, you definitely seem like the kind of guy who can push through adversity and, you know, who's up for a challenge. I think you just have to hold on. I think with most problems and even in entrepreneurship and anything that goes around business, a lot of it's just enduring sometimes, you know, not a rabbit or frantic pace to moving forward. You really just have to, I mean, just take it, you know, and hold on to what you have. But So, um, you, you're, you're, you've cl clearly established this successful business in a rural community, successful businesses in a rural community. What, what are some of the differences that you think uh, trying to run a business in a smaller town, you know, versus you, like you said, you could go to Nashville or Atlanta or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it just comes to value. I think people are loyal to the value that they are given. They're not loyal to a name, to an organization, to or anything. They're loyal to value. And that's the way it should be. That's, that's the market. And I think if you can go anywhere and give people extraordinary value, then you can be successful in that. Um, it's not about – the coffee shop was not designed to be – to make a lot of money. It was, it was made to make money to be able to give back. And I think that – you know, I, I always hate going into coffee shops – and it looks so cool in there. You know, you got the brick wall, you got all that. And then there's just like this super pretentious person behind. I hate that so much. Because it's like, what's this whole atmosphere? The atmosphere is to give value to people in a consistent product, in a clean environment, to be a positive outlook inside of their day, that little window that you have. And I think that if you can do that and, and be good to people and, and respect people and give them um, what they deserve, which is respect above all else, uh, with a smile and give them a, a great consistent product, you can do anything. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's always been that my dad always taught me that too, no matter what it was, uh, just to give value. Cause that's, that's what people deserve to be given. But so where can folks listening to our podcast, where can they find out more about you and the work that you're doing? Um, I know that, uh, martincoffeehouse.com is the website. Yeah. Are there other websites or places where we can find you? Yes, but that that's the main one. Um, we have, that's the easiest one to find. And, and I interlink everything on there, our whole uh, mission. And we do a lot of, on Instagram, we're very heavy on Instagram and Facebook. But yeah, if you go on martincoffeehouse.com, that's, that's the big one. And what is the, uh, because I follow you on all your social media, awesome. what is the, uh, what is the role that that plays in Somebody who's an entrepreneur in a small town, do you find yeah. that having access to social media today, like, you know, 10 years ago was nothing like this. So is that a tool that you think helps your business? Impossible to do it without it. It's all about social, it's all about connecting and like, and giving people access to your life and being transparent. People are really tired of, of, of seeing, well, they, they need transparency. It's, it's demanded. And I think social media allows that window to be there. And I'm very open about it. I share everything. My beautiful son, three months old, shared that whole story and everything. And he's in a lot of our stuff. But I think being an entrepreneur is, I don't know. I think that's the hardest thing in the world. And I think that there is a, a focus on that that's great in a lot of ways. But I feel like, I feel like it's a bubble that's going to pop, to be honest. I really do. I think that entrepreneurship is, is a, a beautiful thing. It's a painful thing. It's like a fight that, that never ends. And you got to love that. You got to love getting beat down and f figuring out solutions to problems with that. Um, but 
you really have to have a, a great um, understanding of what failure is and a healthy relationship with that. Because if you're not prepared to fail constantly, um, then you're, you're not going to be set up for that. And, and I feel like, given it justice, I think that industry jobs, I think that jobs with healthcare plans, I think that jobs that give you consistent work is is more of a thing that should be strived for than mm-hmm. entrepreneurship in mm-hmm. a weird way. I really do. I, I, I think that. I think a but lot. Would you fit in in an industry job? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Right. I want to. I, I want to fight. You Most know, I, entrepreneurs wouldn't. Probably. Yeah, but I feel like the the whole energy behind it is is trying to push everyone to be entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's there's a few of them, and I think the few love that and thrive only in that environment. But I think the majority of people, I don't think they should go for that. I think they should go for what makes them happy. You know, and I think that if they're in a job and they're working, find happiness inside of that. You know, that should be a part of their identity. I think it all stems back to one thing is there is no identity in what people put their work on. They don't have identity in their work, you know? And that's a really hard time. We're about to have 30 small scale, but 30 employees with all that. We're doing a coffee shop. We have one in Martin and end of March, and other shop opens up in Huntington. Okay. We have three staff with um, Fernway. We have some Good Morning Martin. It's an online publication for Martin. We have a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, we'll have about 30 to 35 employees soon. And the hardest thing with employing people in anywhere, but I think specifically inside of these areas with millennials is that they just, there's no, they don't care. Like a wipe a table, they don't care if it's done at a proper uh, standard because it's about putting your name on something. And so that was just drilled into me, clean out the barbecue pits from long ago with the pickaxe where all the grease dropped down. It's like, if I'm going to do this, then my name's on it. And that means something because it's a part of my identity. And I think that people can have so much happiness in life no matter what they're doing, if they really identify with what they're what they're doing and find happiness in that. So this whole entrepreneurial thing, I love it. I thrive in it. I'm all for capitalism. Let's build a business. Let's do it, man. <laughs> I, I want to do that thing. But I think that people shouldn't be pressured into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think absolutely. there's equal value from an entrepreneur and someone who works at a anywhere, gas station, garbage man, anything. And I'll say to further the point with my son, I, I don't necessarily want my son to be an entrepreneur. I don't want that, that life. Because it's very, I love it, but I would rather him be school teacher rather than be anything else that has consistency in a positive environment. I just want him to love what he does. And I think that if more people can do that, I think it'd be more equal. Well, one know? thing I've noticed here is it feels like a lot of people are one thing, but then they also have a side hustle of some sort. So yeah. they are an entrepreneur. They've merged the two. So while they're teaching during the day, they're also writing or starting a small business of, sure. one, of one kind or another. So, you know, and I think maybe the the rural atmosphere lends itself to that kind of a lifestyle because, you know, you can, you can accomplish a lot of different things, you know, with the day. Having to be all, th- a renaissance man, right? Having to be all things to all people, having to do a lot to make it happen. Sure. I mean, yeah, I just, I think it's... Uh, it's just an interesting thing. It's it's very difficult to be able to incur- and be positive about entrepreneurship when it leads to so many people going after something. Imagine a situation like this. People that are prepared for entrepreneurship, um, it could be a great thing, but I think our climate, giving like eighth place trophies and constant validation and having people who are going to classes for entrepreneurship and that they're not built up to be able to withstand what that, what that really is and what that means. And so people who like, enjoy the fight and do that, that's an entrepreneur. I think having a lot of side jobs and, and doing it all together, that's awesome. But I think the, the focus culturally, culturally um, is more damaging than it is positive. And I think it's going to pop. And yeah. I think this whole big thing is going to burst. Yeah. You know, and the reason why is because all the people who are being told that you're not really doing something with your life, working wherever you're working, because you're not working five jobs, you're not being an entrepreneur, and they're not set up for failure because there's no validations in entrepreneurship. They're not going to tell you anything. There's no person telling me good job at the end of the day. So they're going to get beat up. They're going to fail a bunch and they're going to end up more depressed than they would be just going and working a great job and appreciating that. You know, I hate to add to your workload, but you should write a book about that. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's very interesting, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different viewpoint well, from I, what you hear. I, I just I'm so passionate about that. I I really believe. 
that people should live a happy and fulfilled life. And there's so much pressure with people saying what happiness is and what a person being fulfilled is. You know, I don't like the pedestal. I don't even like saying that I'm an entrepreneur. I don't even like that title. But don't you think that the reason why you can be happy in what you do is because you have a bigger goal than just making money? You know, you have a bigger, you know, you're not just trying to get rich. You're yeah. really, you really have a mission and you yeah. have a purpose. Your, your life is driven by that purpose. I would have never started six businesses. I would have never done half the things if it did not demand it. And, and people get that with me. They're saying, I don't get, why, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know, why, why are you so busy? You got a young family. You know, mm -hmm. I get that. I get some real, real flack from that sometimes. Yeah. You know, why are you trying to succeed in this way when you have this at home? And I think, well, one, I, I don't want to place regret on my wife and my child. I hope that doesn't happen with anyone, right? I'm right. never going to use that as a sore point. But for me, it's... I don't know. I just, my overall goal is I want to make an impact inside of Nepal. The best way to do that is through education, specifically inside of literacy. And if I'm going to do it, it needs to be in a sustainable way. So it's always been reverse engineering what I feel called to do, what I feel the problem that I am meant and created to solve is that. And I hope that I don't have to start more businesses to do that, but I probably will to like build that structure to be able to do that. And I feel like anyone can be fulfilled if they have. I don't know, purpose in life, a purpose filled life. You hear so much about that. You know, your purpose in life can be going to work and having a great family and going out on walks and going on vacation. That's purpose. That's fine. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be saving the world. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Like, and I'm so much into this, right? Like I've, I've given my life, yeah. all of my spare time, most of my income to trying to build a, a structure and trying to make a difference in Nepal. But I don't believe that you should do that. Right. You know, I don't think right. that's your responsibility. Right. And I don't think it's the people's of Martin responsibility, although it is so fun to say, hey, Martin, you built a library by buying coffee. I love just informing that, right? And that was going to be one of my questions is, do you think the people that come in and buy coffee, are, are they all aware or any no. aware? Are they no. just buying coffee? No, they're buying coffee. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, don't, uh, I don't live in the delusion yeah. of that, right? Yeah. I, we had, we, re we were really heavy on, we were so heavy on it. We were thinking, this is it, you know? what was set us apart. One, I mean, in marketing, we're saying, hey, you know, they're going to get behind it. They're going to care about Nepal. They're going to get a part of the mission. And there are people that do uh, really dig in more. I've had maybe over the year, like 30 conversations, mm -hmm. like in total, like a whole year, hundreds that we get about 150 to 220 people a day coming in. Wow. Um, and so, but out of that constant times a year, 30 in-depth conversations about it. Um, and about what Nepal is and, and like where, where it's at and our mission. But no, I mean, it's, it's a nice thing, you know, but it's supposed to be that. And for the 30 people who say, man, that's awesome. I'm building a library in Nepal and they get it. Then they take the next step. So then they buy a shirt. Oh, would, do you go on trips? Yeah, we lead trips over to Nepal. And then they go on a trip. And then it just, it just builds. It's always about it's that access. You can't force anybody to do anything, but you can give them access, right? right. You want to make a difference in Nepal? You can start buying a cup of coffee bag of beans, coffee subscription, go on a source trip, do the whole nine yards. But I don't know. I, it, you have to be local, you know? And the end goal is a local community for a local, you know, making, making a local purchase that makes impact locally abroad. Like how do you connect a community to community? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that yet. Yeah. But I know I'm going to figure that out. And I think it, you know, you have to be home first, you know? Yeah. Well, that was going to be my question is what's next. You know, do you, cause you're, you're a young guy, oh, yeah. do you, you know, do you yeah. have, do you, do you yeah. have any long-term planning or vision or are you taking it you oh, know, one no. year at a time? I've always like, my wife helps me so much. I mean, she's, <laughs> she's just the most amazing person in the world because she is just, she lives day by day yeah. and there's just this beautiful joy about her that she brings to my life. And I'm always 10 years in advance. And it just, I just see all these little bitty things that I have to do to reach that. But um, yeah, to answer your question, like coffee for literacy is what's next. And in, two, in a year and a half, I'll have my own roaster. And then I will expand this whole buy cup thing to buy bean thing. And I'll be able to sign up multiple coffee shops into the coffee for literacy program. So if you can imagine the, I mean, even from like a, a PR perspective or from a marketing perspective, if I can go to a coffee shop and I can say, um, here's our amazing fair trade organic coffee. Here's our coffee for literacy program by so many pounds of coffee that, that you buy as a, as a coffee shop, so much is given. 
those coffee shops will adopt, adopt certain projects and that will fund it. And that's scalable. You know, I don't, I do not want to scale Martin sure. coffee house. Um, I don't want to have a hundred of those. What mm-hmm. I do want to have is a massive roastery inside of Martin, Tennessee. And we've already bought the building for that. Mm. And I want that to supply hundreds of coffee shops with a coffee for literacy program. Cause you can imagine how much quicker that goes and then other shops through our social media that will, will adopt our program and adopt our initiative. And the money would be, I mean, my gosh, I mean, I mean, how much quicker could we raise money that way? Not really raise money, but how much quicker could we make the money than donate the money than me having a bunch of coffee shops? And is your family still over in? The yeah, they're there now. So you, yeah. You guys have a great, uh, have a great uh, back and forth, a great way to really help that help that whole area is long term. I mean, and, and it really is. It's every project that we choose to do is secured for 20 years. It, it's not, it's not, not short term. It, it, it can't be because we want to make long term impact in that country. It's twice as hard though, you know, cause we can go in and we could, you know, we can help out whatever way that we can in short term trips. But um, yeah, I mean, it's finally, I'm able to connect to uncle Joe and aunt Tana and be able to be a part of, Really, the legacy that's been left, I mean, it, I don't see if I could have done anything else. It, it would have to be something in Nepal, you know, right, right. growing up with that. I mean, right. absolutely the legacy have and, to. and uh, the yeah. family connection and what a great story. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us today. Thank you. It's been incredible. Um, if anybody wants to find out more, they can go to martincoffeehouse.com. Do you sell t-shirts? Oh, yeah. And beans? Oh, yeah. And, okay, because I'm going to, I don't have to go online. I can just Coffee uh, cups. go right down the... Go right yeah. down the street and buy a bag of beans and a T-shirt. Yes. And anybody else coming to Discovery Park of America needs yeah. to make sure they stop off in Martin um, at Martin Coffee House um, and help uh, educate the folks of Nepal. And now, with something new for all of us to discover, here's Katie Jarvis at Discovery Park of America. Thank you, Scott. I'm Katie Jarvis here at Discovery Park of America, and today we have Zach Ray, who is one of our education specialists here at the park. Zach, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the Battle of Union City, so let's hear about it. Okay. Well, a lot of people from this area probably know about this battle, especially if you come to the park, you can see we have a diorama about it on our entry level um, in the um, Civil War section. Uh, this battle, I've looked up several sites and they talk about, oh, this was a minor battle. Well, to the people who were involved in it, there's no such thing as a minor battle. Uh, this battle actually took place um, March 24th, 1864. What had happened was Nathan Bedford Forrest was actually fighting around this area. And he decided that, I got an idea. The 7th Cavalry the Tennessee Cavalry of the United States is actually over at Union City. I have my 7th Tennessee Cavalry with me. How about we pit them against each other to send them away, like see who's better? He actually taunted his men because his men kept coming up saying, like, oh, we could whip them. We're, we're very strong. We can do it. He actually tells them, says, you boys have been bragging you could whip half a dozen Yankees. You are the 7th Tennessee Rebs. The 7th Tennessee Yanks are at Union City. I'm going to send you there to clean them out. If you don't, never come back. He ends up, so his men are led by a Colonel William Duckworth. And Duckworth hearing this is like, okay, we need to get this job done. So he comes and starts fighting the battle. He ends up fighting this battle. The first time they go at him, they surround them. And they charge horseback on cavalry. And what ends up happening is they get pushed back. So he's like, okay, the horses aren't working. Let's get off the horses. Let's run. So they go on foot. They get actually a little bit closer, but they're pushed back. So that's two attempts. They try a third time. They still can't do it. They do it a fourth time. Well, the fourth time, they finally ride up with a white flag. The, um, the Union see this. And they're like, okay, what's going on? So they ride out there to ask what's going on. And Duckworth tells him, he hands him a piece of paper that says says this, says, I have your garrison completely surrounded and demand an unconditional surrender of your forces. If you comply with the demand, you are promised the treatment due to prisoners of war. According to, 
According to usages in civil warfare, you if you persist in a defense, you must take the consequences. By order of N.B. Forrest, Major General. The commanding officer of the Union uh, garrison at Union City was Colonel Isaac Hawkins. He'd actually fought against Nathan Bedford Forrest before and got beat. Uh, so he knew Forrest's um, reputation. So he was like, oh, okay, this is going to be kind of bad. Let's let's kind of negotiate. So he does, and his men tell him, says, hang on a second. They keep saying they have artillery. Well, if they have artillery, why haven't they used it yet? He decides, like, you know what? They must have had a reason, so they must have it. They surrender. They surrender actually around 300 horses, 500 men. Well, when they come out to surrender and they surrender the fort, uh, Duckworth actually shows them, says, um, you know our artillery that y'all were spying through your telescopes earlier? They're like, yeah. It's like, well, here they are. And he rolls up trees painted black on wagon wheels. They were fake cannons. This is actually one of the Civil War's most audacious bluffs that Duckworth actually got over on the Union. So it's actually fairly, fairly interesting in the fact that this whole bluff stopped the battle in a way. Do you know how long the Battle of Union City lasted? Um, less than a day because afterwards, uh, the following day, uh, Forrest was actually in Paducah and used the same tactic to uh, try to get Paducah, the Fort of Paducah, to surrender, and it didn't work. So it actually didn't last very long. Is there any place here at Discovery Park where you can actually see where the battle was fought? Yeah, actually, you can come if you come to the park, you go to our Civil War area, there, that's on our entry level. You actually look past the window there, you can see a smokestack. Now, that is brown, the old brown shoe store um, smokestack. The battle happened right beside it. You can also see it from our tower. So, Zach, are there any other artifacts from the Battle of Union City here on display at Discovery Park of America? There are. We have two newspaper articles that actually talk about the surrender and some of the implications that this battle actually had upon the overarching Civil War. Thank you, Zach. I know a lot of our listeners, including myself, discovered something new today. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates. Mm-hmm.